so um, uh, let's just get ourselves situated because we had Tuesday off. Um, I hope everybody got all the messages about not going to school on Tuesday for Flex Day. And then prior to that, we did the exam, right? So I have uh, finished up grading the exams. I'll post the results. Um, so we're, that's kind of a big thing behind us. Uh, but I have to say that uh, there are still a few people who have another big thing that needed to be done that's not quite done yet. So I'm talking, of course, about the research essay. Right. And um, I mean, I, I was begging you for it uh, for a while and then I was quiet about that. But again, I got to say that if you're going to look at your midterm grade coming up and you haven't completed that assignment, you are in pretty big trouble in this class. OK, so um, uh, there are ways out of that trouble, like for my office in Artex 170 between 11 a.m. and noon. OK, I'll be happy to discuss ways out of that with you and we can find out exactly what's going on. You know, because this class is part streaming, part in face to face, it's not as easy for me to tell like like what's going on. You know, sometimes I can see if there's a problem. But if you're streaming a lot of classes, I don't really know. Some people have told me that's great. So uh, there, there is a you know, everyone can still do fine in this class. But you got to get everything in, OK? So if, uh, you, if you know if you're missing something, I know if you're missing something too, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, but do come to see me in my office, and we'll work out how that's going to happen. If you're just you know, waiting to hit send, please hit send, OK? ASAP, because we want to go forward uh, with everybody uh, you know, uh, well placed to complete the semester. Again, I have total faith you can all do it. Right? It's just, let's do it. Right? So uh, um, Artex, 170, 11 AM to noon, Tuesday, Thursday. You can talk to me before or after class if that time doesn't work, or email me. We can set up an appointment, okay? just to uh, finish up with that research paper assignment. Uh, five people did submit since I've been begging. Thank you. So, you know, uh, they'll be graded very soon because I have to turn in the midterm grades very soon, too. So, uh, awesome. All right, now looking ahead, uh, at, uh, in the last part of class today, we're going to prepare for um, an assignment that's coming up next week. Uh, it's um, an in class assignment, um, but I did put an announcement up about this. Um, that uh, for those of you who are streaming the class, you can also do this on your own at home. Uh, it's a little different, and I describe how to do it differently. Um, so basically, it is the in-class advertising analysis, and we're doing it next Tuesday. We'll get prepared for it today, and I'll, you know, I'll let you know how that's going to work. But for those of you who are streaming, uh, you can do this at home. You're not required to be here on October 23rd. I think it'll just be a lot more fun and more of a sharing of ideas for those who are here versus those who can't be here. You know, you can turn something in online and get the same credit for it. All right, so it's happening on October 23rd. For those who are turning something in online, uh, October 30th is the deadline for actually submitting a written kind of post to this assignment. But for everyone who's here attending class on the 23rd, we'll get it all done on the 23rd. Okay? And those who present this in class do not have to turn in a written part of that assignment. Okay? That's for those who are uh, going to be uh, streaming at home. All right? So um, before we break out into little groups and do that towards the end of class, I'll go through the prompt and explain it all to you. Okay? But basically, you know, our topic of the day is um, advertising and so this is going to um, you know build on that um, we have a bit of a shorter class today so today I think we're gonna dip in a little bit to the history a little bit to sort of Michael and Lonnie could I yeah just get your attention all right well let's 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 I know your your guys are gonna be working together on that assignment but let's let's hold that until like 1030 okay so uh, um, we were, uh, yeah, we're going to dip into a little bit of history, look at a little bit of current practice in terms of you know, how advertising is sold and done in broadcasting. 
um, and look at an example anyway of uh, sort of how one product has been advertised through electronic media, at least you know, uh, in in three little clips, if you want. Uh, and we're also going to at least you know try to think both about how functionally useful advertising is, but also how we should look at it a little bit critically because sometimes it doesn't always tell us you know the whole story about a product. Obviously. So um, I often draw this little triangle where I put, you know, on one side, um, like producers. On another side, I'll put networks. And up here, what would be the third term up here if I'm looking at basically, you know, the key parties that are involved in electronic broadcasting? What should go up here? Question 40 on the exam. Almost everybody got it right. Advertisers. Advertisers, awesome. Thank you. All right. So it's, you know, this is the kind of structural trinity uh, for, uh, for the broadcast industry. You know, creative people making the programs, which will attract audiences, you know, audiences delivered by the networks, and all of it paid for by advertisers. At least that's the way it, it developed in the electronic media. You know, uh, so of course there's uh, subscription-based media, and there's some that are you know you can maybe subscribe to Hulu. You pay some money to subscribe, but you also get advertisements delivered to you. So there can be you know variations on this kind of either or. Either it's ad supported or it's subscription, and you pay money for it. Sometimes in between, but advertising is still really essential. So um, after we do our presentations next week on Tuesday, October 23rd, we'll you know, talk about you know, the shape that advertising takes nowadays. Um, but you know, we're all really exposed to a lot of advertisements. Can you guys think back to, like, what's the very first ad that you remember? And what medium was it in? But like, what was it about, if you think back to like, Something way back. Do you remember any good, any advertising? There's a lot of acne advertisements. What's that, Chad? There was a lot of acne advertisements. A lot of acne advertisements? Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Oh. Were those on TV or? Oh, okay. You remember a brand that was associated? Oh, that's interesting. Like when I think of advertising, I sometimes I just think of a brand rather than a than, than a particular product. Yeah. Oh. Michael. I remember uh, watching TV and the singular ad would pop up on the screen. They'd be like, can you hear me now? For those types of like, the phones and stuff. Was that the slogan, hear me out? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? OK. Did other people did you remember that one? OK. This is where I must declare a generational divide because it's like oh, a lot of stuff. Believe me, if you if you heard the ads that I remember, it's like what? Prehistoric. Michaela, you had one too. Oh, I just remember like the kind of like infomercial type ads where it's like call now, eighteen hundred to order. So the, the right the real hard sell type of thing. You remember what they were selling? Just different things like I remember Flown was one of them, like the little dots that you put into. The that light up, just oh, okay, interesting. And I guess you guys, you, you were attracted because you were pretty young and you were interested in toys and stuff. Oh, That's interesting. So we got the hard sell technique in there, which was really I like, call now. <clears throat> I love on The Simpsons whenever Homer sees one of those ads, he starts salivating. La, 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 no. <laughs> Talk about a direct effect. Remember, we talked about strong effects in media. It's like you watch The Simpsons and Homer's just like, I gotta have it. Um, and then, Michael, what would you say would be the kind of, you know, was, how was Singular trying to hook you into getting their service? You know, I know they had a nice slogan. No, it's like, I would like, I would like turn on the TV and I was just, the ads would come up and I was like, phones. I'm like, because my, my mom and dad didn't get phones until the car ended up breaking down. So we, my mom and dad kind of crazy and didn't have phones. I'll be like, I think it's time for you to get a phone. The ad pops up. But she'll be like, I think we need to get a phone. Well, that's convenient, right? So by putting the ad right in front of you exactly when you need the product, 
then it, uh, it you know, becomes appealing, right? So, so that's actually uh, sort of a recognized strategy of advertising is to determine needs, potential needs of a client, and then get a message in front of them. So just like when your mom and dad kind of needed the thing, there was, you know, the, the cell phone company said, hey, we, we got you covered, you know? So that's, that's one form of strategy or technique, I guess. I feel like it still comes to this day when they come with the new, the iPhones, like they keep playing the ads, like, oh yeah, go out, go get, go get your new iPhone. It's like, yeah, but if you have a working phone and it's like, it's not breaking down, like you don't need to like upgrade. Like my mom, she had an iPhone 7 and it was brand new and everything. And then she saw the like an ad where you could buy one Note 8, you get one free from AT&T. And so the next day she went and got one. Okay. It's not like, it's just you don't need to get a new phone. All right, has anyone else like got a, a, an ad story that uh, is, I'm thinking about, there's, you know, again, Michael's story is largely about utility, but if we stay on the idea of having the latest, shiniest thing, what, what does that say, you know, like, I don't know if you want to buy the latest, uh, you know, the latest iPhone if you want or something else. Does, is there another dimension? You don't need it. Basically, what Michael's saying is my mom didn't need it. So what other reason would you want to, uh, you know, if you were an advertiser, you're thinking, well, they've already got this. So how else could I sell it to them? Social status. Social status. Awesome. Thank you, Michaela. So, uh, you know, we could call that image. And, but really, yes, we're talking about social status too, right? So you've got that iPhone X, whatever it is, R, S, or I don't know, there should be just like a dollar sound, you know? right behind it. So yeah, there, it's saying something about you. It's giving, it's tying you to an image. You know? I, I'm a dinosaur again. So when I, I remember when cell phones were being rolled out and part of uh, a, another technique that was used is you would see like, you know, kind of the window of a house and the blackened silhouette of a, you know, a, a, a woman with the phone, you know, and it was, it was kind of like a scare tactic as well was like, you need this phone in case something bad is happening or something, and you might be somewhere, you know, or there'd be ads of, you know, people alone at night in a parking lot, and it's like, God, got to have that phone, you know. So, so there, there was also, you know, sometimes maybe an, an emotional technique as well. Uh, and, you know, in that case, sadly, it was fear. <clears throat> but of course, if you look at our political advertising nowadays, that's not an issue at all, right? Right? No. Of course, they're trying to scare us all the time. Those terrible, well, actually, half the country is trying to scare themselves so that they get elected. OK. Well, this is you know, maybe just a list that we've started to create about, the, about the, uh, um, the techniques of advertising, if you want. Um, and so bring it to the present day. Are there any ads that, uh, you know, that you think are like right now, like just stand out in your mind, really effective or catchy or kind of, you know, viral or like, you know, drilled into your brains? Yeah, Michaela. Donna just released like a new collection for her Fenty line and it's like everywhere. Like it's on my Twitter, it's on my Instagram. <laughs> okay. So, so you're impressed by the ubiquity of it? The fact I that it's everywhere? Oh, okay, it's, a, it's just everywhere. It's just everywhere. Okay, so that's definitely, you know, one one other technique is you know, mass exposure, blanketing for sure. And any others, Michael, uh, or cell phones? No, uh, <laughs> I keep like I get ads a lot about the new Call of Duty game, and all these new games that are coming out. Come pre-order your new game at uh, GameStop. Okay. So it's and where are you seeing that? Like, Michaela's seeing it in everything, right? All, all social media. You see seeing that? It's pretty. I see it on my Instagram, my uh, Twitter, all my uh, YouTube ads, while I watch TV. OK. i ad over here for it with the stop. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that ubiquity is really important. Or, you know, just because nowadays you never know exactly where you're, you're used, you're used to be able to count on your audience being watching television, you know, but nowadays it's uh, millions of channels everywhere. So, 
So it, it's really carefully thought out, that whole aspect of it. Okay, well, yes, Max? I think the one that sticks with me the most is the behind the Mac ad, because I don't understand it at all. Like, okay. I don't get it. Oh. And I don't know why, but right. it's everywhere. Like, it's on billboards, it's on my phone, it's everywhere. But I'm not sure what they're trying to go for yeah. with it. Yeah. I uh, I have not that one. I'm not aware of that one. But I've I've sometimes had that. I was like, what's what's the point of this? Why? Are... Yeah. And so sometimes I feel like I'm not in on the joke or on the you know or the serious point or whatever. I just don't know. But sometimes I suspect that they make stuff really inscrutable because they just want you to yeah. wonder about it. Is exactly. that what you think too? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else had any? Does that ring a bell? Like ads where you look at it, just go. Whoa. There's a funny one down near Light Rail Studios. Uh, I go like just about every weekend, and uh, there's this like uh, I don't know if you saw this a billboard, and there's a guy there kind of like squeaky clean, and he's got a headset, and, and the the thing says, "I'm Brandon, and I have a headset." You know, and it was like, really? <laughs> what's, the, what's the point, right? And I can't even remember what the brand was or the company was, but it was kind of like, why, why? But it was you know kind of being purposely obscure, I think. Well, uh, um, that doesn't lead to a real segue, except <laughs> now we've got to look a little bit into the textbook and some of the history of this. But uh, uh, it, this will be really useful to us in uh, a, a little while when we come back and sort of start talking about, um, about uh, uh, analyzing some advertisements for our, at, our assignment for what we'll do in class next, uh, next class next Tuesday. And you know, Max, Max just brings up an important point. These things are made for us to understand their communication. And so we do think about them. We, we sometimes puzzle over them. And sometimes they lodge in our minds for forever and ever, for a long time. You know? So uh, it's, uh, it's important stuff in addition to being uh, you know, the way the industry pays for a lot of, a lot of things. And so, uh, so well worth spending you know, a, few, a few classes on this. Typically, our textbook takes a incredibly you know, long view of this, right? From clay tablets to digital tablets. But today, we don't have a whole lot of time. So I wanted to dip into some, you know, like let's say maybe some, some highlights. You know? uh, and so the scope of the discussion of advertising and electronic media extends beyond just you know advertising but out more generally to marketing and also promotion you know and so uh, to you know not to belabor belabor the breakdown of that but you know it really it has to do with you know people selling products to audiences and it's just become uh, as Michaela's example and others of you have said you know, in, in this new digital uh, uh, ecosphere or media sphere, it's, it's just there are so many channels that we can be reached. Um, it's, um, it's interesting to look at, but I think it's also challenging to analyze. It's super challenging to regulate as well. You, know? you used to be able to have rules about political advertising on TV, and they would stick, right? But then political advertising moves over into social media. And then there's no rules, right? And so then you've got the abuse of social media uh, and, and, and advertising that way. And then you're counting on Facebook to clean up its act, you know, whereas we used to have you know, a, regulate, a regulator who, who actually would take care of this. But it's so diverse now that uh, it's, it's a challenge for regulators. So next week, you know, I think we could maybe profitably end on that. But this aspect of promotion is just more generally, you know, it ties in um, electronic media uh, advertising to, you know, social social campaigns. Before there was social media, there were people in the street. There were parades. There was, you know, uh, public events that were organized, and that also was a form of of advertising, even if there wasn't an agency with a client buying a spot or something like. That. So uh, early on in you know the rise of radio in the 1920s, 
uh, we've specifically already talked about, you know, some of the early advertising uh, that, you know, kind of, it was all happening in the same time in the early 1920s, right? Uh, where they were sort of figuring out, what do we put on the radio? How do we pay for that, right? And uh, one of the, um, one of the first ideas came out of, of course, AT&T, the phone company, also involved in Telegraph, you know, thought, well, maybe we're just going to like use this and allow people to purchase airtime, to buy, buy to airtime. And so, you know, this is very much like um, an infomercial back in the day. Like they could buy 10 or 15 minutes and then, you know, talk on the air about a real estate development or something. You know, come see these great houses or stuff like that. So they called that toll broadcasting, right? Because they charged you like a toll, almost like to get on a highway where you had to pay, you know, and that would contribute to keeping up the highway. Well, here it was sort of like an information highway, you know, where you'd pay to get on there and put your message. Um, but they did find after a while that, you know, infomercials were not very attractive to people who bought radios because, you know, it was, got kind of boring after a while. Uh, and they developed uh, musical jingles, stuff like that that we would now kind of recognize as still part of advertising. You know? um, so back in the day, 1920s, I, I, I said, you know, I wanted maybe for us to look at uh, the historical stuff too, even ever so briefly or something. So there's a page in your modules called a look back at classic advertising. Uh, and I have to say, uh, there's a bit of an agenda here. I'd like, you know, advertising can be really constructive. It can teach us about products that are useful to us. It can also be a little bit misleading. And uh, there's a very famous example from early in the days of electronic broadcasting, uh, which was part of like a basic social campaign uh, organized by this fellow named Edward Bernays, who was, anyone heard of him in a public relations class or something like that? It's really kind of legendary. Uh, you know, I might just show the video and then, and then um, fill in some little, it's just like three minutes or so. But what this basically was, was it was a cigarette manufacturer who was uh, trying to sell cigarettes to a new target audience, a new market. And uh, um, they developed a particular Who invented it? Campaign. Here's where it gets crazy. All right, well, here's where it gets crazy. I mean, my videos come from the internet. But uh, it's, uh, um, the idea was how can we sell cigarettes to women who are you know, dealing with a social prejudice that to smoke is unladylike? And so, this is what Edward Bernays came up with. The art of modern public relations can be generally traced to one man, Edward Bernays. There were other earlier innovators, but none altered the social landscape of North America as profoundly. Born in Vienna, Austria in 1891, Bernays' family moved to New York City about a year after his birth. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and like his uncle, Bernays was captivated by the convoluted processes of the human mind. Bernays often consulted his uncle's work, and he was the first to incorporate psychology and other social sciences into PR. Yet where Freud sought to uncover motivations, Bernays sought to mask them, and Bernays' clients were companies rather than individuals. For example, one of his early cases involved Lucky Strike cigarettes in the 1920s. The American tobacco company asked him to expand sales. Women would be an ideal market, but there were problems. First, women didn't care for the green packaging of Lucky Strikes, and the manufacturer concluded that changing the color was too expensive. Second, it was taboo for women to smoke in public. Bernays took a unique approach to these obstacles. First, he recommended that if the packs must stay green, they should make green the premier color of the fashion season. During his green ball campaign, Bernays convinced French designers to incorporate green into their latest fashion lines, and not just any green, but the specific dark green shade of Lucky Strike packaging. 
He also engineered a green gala at the Waldorf Astoria, featuring some of society's most prominent tastemakers. To address the problem of smoking in public, he linked Lucky Strike cigarettes to the women's liberation movement, arranging for young women to march down Fifth Avenue, smoking and calling the cigarettes torches of freedom. Instead of appearing to sell cigarettes, this seemingly spontaneous march appeared to be a part of the struggle for gender equality. Suddenly, Lucky Strike cigarettes didn't just have packaging that matched the latest Parisian fashions, they also made a statement about women's equality. It's easy to see how these associations could skew market opinion, and the campaign was enormously successful. If you're like most people, then you probably assume that you know where your opinions come from. And if you're like most people, you're probably wrong. Humans tend to think of each belief as the result of a rational analysis, but this is not entirely true. Instead, our opinions are subtly influenced in numerous ways, and we're often not aware of this process. Edward Bernays tapped into this phenomenon to increase the sales of hairnets, cigarettes, bacon, and more, but that's just the beginning. He didn't restrict his talents to selling consumer goods. He persuaded consumers and citizens to approve of several other things. And that's probably something his clients don't want you to know. Oh, okay. So what did you think of the Torches of Freedom idea? It's a genius marketing campaign, but it's kind of sad to Okay, so Michaela, I don't know if you heard Gabe was coming in. Michaela said it was a genius marketing campaign, but it was kind of sad because it... just able to kind of just fall into the trap. Able to fall into the trap. Okay, yeah, and, and the, the tone of the whole video was very much like, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, we want to give people credit for critical thinking, I think, and, and that's, you know, a very important thing to, to me and everything I teach and, and I hope to you guys and everything you study, too. Uh, you know, although it sounds great if you're Sigmund Freud's nephew to say, I can tap into the hidden motivations and make you do this or that, you know, I think we can also all critically think about stuff too. And, and it's, it's definitely not inevitable, uh, uh, the, the persuasion of this type. But uh, what do you think? So it was genius. Michaela said it was genius. What, what about, you know, what do you think particularly about Torches of Freedom? would appeal. William, any ideas? The rebranding of, of a product to, uh, to mean something completely different, I think, is a smart move. I mean, we see it happening right now with what Nike's been doing with their social justice warrior campaigns. Like, uh -huh. nobody at Nike cares about people. <laughs> but if, it's, if it sells them more shoes, they'll put Colin Kaepernick on the front of their ads. Great example. Thank you. I love it. Do other people see any parallels there in terms of... Yep, yeah, Max? I just think it's crazy how far they went. Like, made the color... They somehow got people to make the color of the season green. Uh-huh. And uh -huh. then they held a gala. Like... Right, right. That's yeah. insane to me. Like, you just don't see that today. I agree with you, you know, and I think in part, you know, it is part of mass society at the time, you know, is that you could orchestrate that type of thing more effectively now where it's like it's just all over the place, you know. Who knows what's going to get into your Twitter feed, right? I mean, sure, maybe, like, I don't know if this could be linked to, like, the start of the, like, physical fashion accessory thing, like, because... These days, it's, it's, it's weird things. It's not like a cigarette. It's like a water bottle, that, mm. like a Yeti. That's mm. like a cool fashion accessory now, I guess. Yeah. I just don't, like, I just don't understand it. Yeah. I, you know, it's, well, it's, it's a real interesting point. It's, it's almost as though, just as all of, we've got now a million channels to, to you know, advertise through, we also have like a million products, you know, down to these tiny little accessories and stuff, which can, be pushed through those channels, right? But in the in the early days of mass communication, where it was incredibly expensive to reach people because you had so few channels, you know, then you probably you were pushing bigger, 
more expensive products like a car or something like that versus now it costs you fractions of a penny to get into somebody's you know Facebook feed or Instagram feed or something and so maybe then little things can be you know sold that way in our fragmented uh, universe it's, it's a real interesting idea actually I hadn't thought about it until until now so that's cool um, well I, I just want to pivot for a second uh, because we're, we're just, we just got to this notion that, you know, mass media is very expensive versus, you know, kind of the personal media channels that we can use through social or something like that uh, is, um, you know, is, is much cheaper, but you're kind of also spreading your message in through a much more kind of uh, chaotic and diverse field. But let's just focus for a second uh, back into mass media. Um, and where was it? I was on here, just with this, you know, distinction that when they figured out that advertising was going to support broadcasting, uh, because then the advertisers would pay for the programs which were given away to the audiences, and the audiences, you know, bought into it because it was free entertainment, and they just had to put up with some, you know, messaging and stuff. When they began this type of thing, for the first 20, 30 years, advertisers would sponsor a whole show, a whole program, you know. And so it would be the GE, uh, you know, radio hour or something like that. You know, I Love Lucy, we looked at an example. That was, I think, the Lucky Strike actually uh, was the sponsor for that. So a show would, for a whole hour, would have a single sponsor. Um, and we moved away from that gradually to spot advertising, which remember is like those are your 60 second or shorter commercials or stuff. Is there anywhere that you still see like in broadcasting or in media uh, sponsorships? You see it in, you see it in public TV all the time, right? Because they're not allowed actually to, or they don't use spot advertising. You see any, any sponsorships? Like, well, like on social media, like on Instagram, when one of the, you know, the public figures that have a lot of followers, like they have sponsorships with yeah. the wider teeth or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, Desiree. Yeah, that's for sure. There's, there's, you know, a whole kind of class of celebrity or minor or even non-celebrity, they call them influencers, right? I don't know if we've talked about that in this class, but yeah, definitely in social media, you know, you know, President Ronald Reagan was a spokesperson for GE, right? And before he became president, like 30 years before he became president, but that was part of his gig, you know? And, and nowadays, uh, there are still personalities uh, doing it. And I would say, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and those podcasts are sponsored. You know, typically it's like, and, you know, there's very often just one client who's pushing it. Um, but we have largely moved to spot advertising uh, because it's less risky, right? If you uh, sponsor a show that flops, then the whole thing looks bad for your brand and stuff. If you're just a 60-second spot, one out of 10 or 15 in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an hour-long show, uh, the, the show gets canceled, it's cool. You're just you're in another show. You're not tied to the success of a, of a show or something like that. So um, spot advertising picked up, uh, starting really with television. Um, so, uh, uh, well, let's let's dip back into uh, the uh, the world of cigarettes again. <laughs> I uh, I find it to be one of the, you know, never having been a smoker, I find it just like why would people want to do this? However. Uh, so this is an advertisement from, this is really very interesting. This is a television advertisement, but it, it's, it's, um, it's from a show. This is the first television broadcast of a radio show. So it was known to the audience as radio. It, this is its first TV broadcast, and it is a sponsored show sponsored by Chesterfield Cigarettes. And there's a few very interesting things in this clip, I hope. So let me turn off the lights so you can actually see it. Before. <laughs> OK. Uh, that's good enough, right? We just don't get a little light to see each other. So cool. It's showtime. 
time at the Chesterfield Supper Club on the air five nights a week with America's greatest singing star. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Supper Clubbers, here it is Christmas Eve and a very exciting one for us because tonight, for the first time, we are being televised. Aren't we? A. B. This is Martin Block speaking for more than 6,000 wholesale distributors and over a million retail outlets all over America who always have Chesterfields on hand for you. I want to tell you now about a group of men and women who are smoking cigarettes as a profession. Yes, that's a fact. You see, a leading research organization trained a group of scientists and technicians to study and record the difference in smoking qualities of cigarettes. These expert smokers became the country's first cigarette taste panel. For more than a year, under strict laboratory controls, they tested and compared leading brands, smoking thousands and thousands of cigarettes. Recently, this research organization reported this fact. Chesterfield is the only cigarette in which members of the panel found no unpleasant aftertaste. Now, if you don't know how much pleasure and comfort a cigarette can give you, smoke Chesterfield and you'll see. Chesterfields smell milder, and they smoke mild. And after you smoke them, they leave no unpleasant aftertaste. So, buy Chesterfields today. Or else I shall be. A question of uh, how uh, how much obligation were they required to tell the truth in, in advertising back then, as opposed to now where you can wear a lab coat and say you're a doctor when you're not. And uh, people are expected to, uh, to understand that. What, what is, is that the same expectation in here? Or, I or wish I, I wish I was knowledgeable and enough. <laughs> I don't know, William. I'm That's sorry. Wild. It's it, definitely there's a lot of there's a lot of like kind of doctor recommendations for smoking in print ads at the time. So I, I'm pretty sure that uh, that the restrictions on you know telling the truth were looser back in those days. But I don't know exactly. Cool. It's, it's a good it's a good question though. Um, what did you guys, uh, other people, what did you think about that? I feel like I just kind of Sorry, Desiree? Like I'm just watching that. I feel like I just kind of breathe. It's kind of gross, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope no one was, like, convinced that they should start smoking based <laughs> on that advertisement. That, that's the, actually the opposite of what I would want, you know, to come out of the, you know, this, but but more specifically about broadcasting, uh, you know, I think I think it demonstrates a few interesting things. Number one, first time they go on TV, they're still very radio, right? They're they're just like when he turns and looks in the camera and says, "I'm talking to you." It's kind of like it's ridiculous, <laughs> but but you can really, you know, they're just starting to get the hang of the medium, which is which is is interesting. Uh, but there's you know the, this idea that you sell a product based on needs and that you try to kind of itemize, you know, the good things about, so, so product qualities uh, would be front and foremost in this type of advertising, advertising back in the day, you know? So what you need is you need an expert panel who will taste the product and then, you know, come back to you with an objective, you know, it's almost like quote unquote scientific approach, you know, because they're a panel of, of experts and stuff. So this idea that you should sell something based on its product quality, that you could actually, you know, uh, <laughs> quote unquote objectively prove, I think that that's an interesting thing. And when we do our analysis, I'd like you to take a look and see, can you find any ads where this is an important, you know, uh, strategy in the ad? Because a lot of other stuff nowadays, I would say, is more about image and status, you know. And even if you look into, I, I have another reel of, of commercials that I don't have time to dip into. But if you look at, you know, through the 60s and 70s, it's much more about creating an image of the smoker or of any, you know, consumer of whatever product you want to sell. You know, create an image and then try to tie the, the, the client to that image. Like, if you buy this, you'll be this, you know? And so that's a, 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 the other approach that I'd like you to look for 
when we get into our little assignment is more, you know, this kind of image-based stuff, you know. So, uh, so those are the two big strategies that, that, that I would want to look at, you know. Um, okay, so that was an interesting moment in broadcast history. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it still is coming out of an era where, you know, they were moving, they were a sponsored show, but eventually they're moving into spots. And uh, I brought this up maybe, well, this looks a little crazy until we talk about it. What I just wanted to say here is that uh, the selling of spots continues in today's broadcasting world. You know, next Tuesday we're going to get into, you know, advertising through social media and other channels, which are quite different. You know, you're well aware that when you click on something on a website, you know, somebody's making a fraction of a cent that way. But in old media, just because we're kind of still there today uh, um, in our lecture, but also, you know, on the FM dial, this is still the way it works. So let me just explain this to you uh, uh, briefly. But what this is is a rate card for uh, Clear Channel, which is now iHeartRadio. So this is kind of old, right? Sorry, it's not, it's not up to date, but it's really hard to get a hold of this type of stuff. Um, so this is for KMEL. Uh, and what it is, is it's the price per spot that is being sold. Uh, and um, if we just look into it, it's basically week by week, it gives the prices of how much 60 seconds would cost to get on the air on KMEL. And uh, so this is like the week of June 18th, June 25th, July 2nd, July 9th. And then you look down here, and you've got your morning period. You got your midday period and you got your afternoon period because, you know, this is old broadcast media. We're still on basically a day part schedule. You know, we talked about that. So the day is split into different parts. And in radio, uh, you know, per, the drive time is the time when you have the biggest audience. And so you'd see that the price, for instance, varies depending on uh, here. On the week coming right up, it's $870 for a minute spot on KMEL. Uh, so that's in the morning drive period. But if you just go down and look at it, we're, we still want to be on KMEL. Sorry, I just went too fast with my little scroll button. If you go down into the evenings, the price drops down to, uh, so PM, uh, we're, where are we? That's the evening drive time still at $900, but at night it drops down to $193. So there's a huge difference in pricing based on what day part you're in because of, you know, how, uh, how, how big your audience is and, uh, and where they are. Frankly, radio, as we said, is still really only competitive in the car. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of the business aspect still of selling spots in, you know, old media, let's say, uh, where the spot really is what we, what's being sold. So if you're a client, you would go to KMEL. And interesting thing about this rate card is it's completely dynamic. Like if you go in as a client, this type of software is the same software that the general design used for booking hotel rooms or for air, air flights. You know, basically, because the, the value of the spot changes. If you want to buy it the week before, it's 870 bucks. If you buy it two weeks before, same spot, 600 bucks. And you see the price going down until you hit maybe a July 4th weekend or something, which will keep the price up. And these prices will fluctuate based on how much advertising of inventory. They've already sold 90% of the, of the next week. They only have 10% left, so it's really expensive to get that. But if you look further down, they've only sold 60 or 50%, and it's a lot cheaper, you see? And so the price will constantly fluctuate based on the inventory that they've got, just like if you want to buy a flight tomorrow, it will cost you a fortune. But if you buy a flight a few weeks in advance, it will actually cost you a lot less. If you buy in volume, all of these will change, you know, because no one buys one spot. You can't have any influence, right, with one spot. You're going to buy hundreds. And so then volume pricing will bring this down. So all of this is really now just sold through a computer. Back in the day of the 40s and 50s, they'd actually have like a, 
a printout, you know, and you say, yep, 25 bucks for a spot. Anytime, anything, I just want the 25 bucks. But now it's totally dynamically priced, just like getting a hotel or, or, an, or an airplane. And same thing is for television as well. You know. So um, uh, next class or the class afterwards, we should also talk about career opportunities in you know, broadcast media sales, because a lot of people don't think about it. But some of our graduates, you know, uh, I'm thinking of um, uh, a fellow named Felix who actually went and did a, uh, you know, the, these, these guys actually train you. Like they'll fly you to Texas for uh, two, three weeks and, and, you know, give you a course. And, uh, and you know, uh, it is uh, an interesting idea to keep in mind that, you know, it's not all about production. It's, sales is also an interesting thing you might want to go into. So we can talk more about that, you know, in, uh, in a, uh, next week, I would say, right? But just wanted to, to drop in there. Um, so, uh, folks, uh, cigarettes now, this day, right? What is your experience of Juul or of that type of thing? Advertising, you've heard about it, obviously, for sure. Do you, you know, when you see that, uh, are, you are you surprised, basically, when you see that, you know, the targeting of a youth, a youth market that way? I see, okay. I go pick up my, uh, I, I drop off and pick up my little brother from school. And I see all these high school students with jewels. I'm just like, it's stupid. You're, like, you're going to damage your lungs at a young age and stuff. And my brother, ha my older brother has like 20 of them. My god. Wow. OK. Because he works at a smoke shop, so he gets them. OK. And he just ha has 20 of them. I'm just like. Well, how about the marketing, though, the advertising of them, though, Michael? Yeah. It's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. It's on buses. It's on, like, um, on your phone. I was like seeing. Sorry, let's go to Gabe though, because he had his hand up uh, quick. Uh, I'm, but I don't want to cut you. Okay. She could finish. My bad. I was just trying to ask something about. You were just one of what? Never mind. Okay, Michael. Sorry, I just you know wanted to go to like, Gabe. Like they had like a jewel, and they said it's not a it's not a flash drive. People yes. Think it, yes. It's like it's a, no, it's it's like it's e-cigarette. Yeah. Well, I, I can't figure out whether those ads are for parents who are scared because they don't even recognize this new kind of threat, or whether those ads are kind of subtly just saying, yeah, cool, you can get this and hide this from your parent. I mean, I'm thinking of a specific one that's on a bus stop near my place. OK, so the, the, most there's. Of those are, yes. Most of those are uh, uh, smoke-free California ads. Got it. OK, so they are, they are kind of PSAs trying to demonize it. Gabe? Like they do it for the aesthetic. Like they don't really do it because like they want to. Like they just do it because they think it just looks like you know cool or whatever. Right. And, and doesn't that tie in with kind of the image social status? Yeah, right. Yeah. right. Max. I mean, that's what I was gonna say. It's like I think it is very social status based. My sister, my sister has one. She's like fourteen. And I know, right? I <laughs> Um, and I feel like she. I mean, I. From like talking to her, she started because all of her friends were doing it, and it was cool. Mm. I don't think anyone realizes at that age that they're signing up for something that they don't exactly want to be signing up for. Right. It's tough to get out of it, right? Exactly. It's, it's a physical addiction. Uh, you know, part of the there's a link to this in your modules, and again, we're moving so fast today. But um, this is you know the um, Jewel was criticized by you know look at this they. When they roll it out, they create a big party. Doesn't that remind you of the green ball? You know what I mean? It's, it hasn't changed that much in its way, right? And you know, although they say, oh, we only market this to adults, right? Uh, who, you know, who are they tweeting out? There's a bunch of people who don't, they don't look like you know, they're, they're adults. They look like maybe teenagers might want to aspire to look like that. You know? And so uh, they're, they're, you know, they're playing a, um, they're playing a uh, destructive game, if you ask me. You know, uh, again, I, I just want you to think critically about this, make your own opinions. But uh, you know, for a product which is a, what does it really give you? B, it's addictive. And, you know, there's just a whole 
the history here that I think is, you know, Jewel is, is a, a, new, a new step along the road here. Gosh, okay. But, uh, well, let's, again, we're moving fast today. It's a bit of a short class. Uh, and we, but luckily we have a couple more scheduled next week that we can do this. I wanted to get now to uh, the assignment that we're going to prep for here, which is an in-class assignment. Uh, I've neglected people in chat here. Luckily, they're not chatting away behind my, you know, with interesting stuff that I am not uh, uh, passing on to you. But uh, let's let's bring up the in-class advertising analysis assignment, and I want to give you like maybe 10 minutes to just sit here uh, and consider your options, and maybe look through uh, some magazines for some uh, advertisements that. Um, that you might want to talk about in class next week. So uh, the first thing I want to repeat from what I said at the start of the class, uh, which is that this can be done either as an in-class assignment here, where we do a presentation, or it can be done uh, at home, online, uh, where you do the similar reflection, but you have to write it up and submit it as a short writing assignment online. Uh, we will do this on October 23rd, next Tuesday. Those of you who are online who can't make it in, or if today you're here but you can't make it in for Tuesday and you prefer to stream, you can do this assignment, get credit for it by writing a short post and, and uh, presenting it that way. And hopefully we'll have a chance to read some of those over at least. So my objectives in this assignment, I'd like to see if we can demonstrate at least one persuasive technique. We've talked about selling a product based on its qualities that will connect with the needs of a target audience. And we've talked about another strategy, which is more selling a product based on an image that people would like to tie themselves to. So I'd like you to, uh, to you know, see if you can develop one of those techniques, OK? Another thing that we're going to do is analyze some advertisements, and I have uh, uh, my, my dentist uh, gave me a bunch of old magazines from his office, so you know we could analyze uh, um, a, uh, uh, an advertisement that we have chosen, trying to see, okay, what is the technique that's actually being used? And the other thing is to demonstrate an understanding of the concept of demographics, right? We've talked about that in the way that media companies understand their audience through demographic qualities like age, gender, uh, and uh, uh, ethnicity in some cases, and then some lifestyle choices like education, uh, financial you know, level, and such type of thing. So I'd like you to think about advertisements or a specific advertisement that you might find based on um, uh, uh, who's, who's the target audience for this? Who do you think they're trying to reach with this advertisement? Okay. So I, have, I, I brought in these, these um, um, magazines that we could, we could look at. So um, there's one more wrinkle to this. What, what I'll do is just some folks have already got magazines, and, and I'll try to put people in groups of two, three maybe, and look through a magazine and pick, pick an advertisement to think about. Uh, and maybe you could shoot a picture of it and bring it home. Uh, with you. Um, if you don't have your phone, I can probably lend you the magazine and stuff. So you could think about it a little more. And then next class, I'll give you 10, 15 minutes just to like put your heads together and come up with a real brief two, three minute presentation that one or everybody in the little group can do, which will basically, we'll put, you know, we'll put the advertisement up on the screen and you can just tell us, well, did you think that, you know, what type of strategy was used? And then who do you think the target audience was for this? OK? So that's, that's what we hope to do. And uh, to make it a little more fun, I'd like you to pretend that you are in an ad agency. And you're basically pitching this. So you'll say, um, here, I, I'm just going to do a little pitch for, um, let's see. Gosh, sometimes it's hard to find. Oh, here we go. All right. This is a wonderful one. Can you see this? I should turn on the dock cam. But okay, so it's um, it's 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 based, it's an Amazon advertisement uh, for uh, kind of hair hue, like a little a hair tint, hair dye, if you want. You know, uh, so this could be one that you could pick at. And who would you say 
Well, first of all, is this, um, I don't really have the time. I've only got 10 minutes. Um, but let's see, document camera, if we can get this working fast. Sometimes it's able. Does it say like it's a special kind of hair tint? Check it out. I should show you this in a sec if this thing is on. And we will, there it is, OK. Chow says zoom in. Turn right. Let's zoom in on this. Okay. So you've seen the general context of the visual context of the ad. Your textures, your hues, all here. Oh. Introducing a new, whole new way to shop for your hair type. Okay. So it's actually it's it's extensions, right? Okay. No, it's for textured hair, so like products. Gotcha. Hair products. All right. So we can clearly see uh, a target audience for this, right? in terms of demographic, so ethnicity, gender, age, et cetera, right? So that's a pretty good indication of the target audience here. Another interesting thing when you're thinking of target audience is, you know, what's the channel? So sometimes you just, you're looking at the ad saying, okay, I, I got a guess as to who this is for. In this case, it's like so painfully obvious that, you know, and then I'm looking in the channel Right? So that's suggesting a target audience, too. And then the other thing I'm thinking about is, OK, in terms of how this is organized, in terms of, you know, is it telling me a lot about, you know, the qualities of the product? Or is it more creating an image that people might want to aspire to? I don't really have a good answer for that. What do you guys think about this one? Because natural hair is very hard to maintain, and for a while there wasn't a lot of products on the market that could help. So I'm, like as someone that uses these products, I see it as like, oh, Amazon has a wide selection of stuff I can use personally. Okay. Does that mean that then it's a product kind of quality, utility to it? Okay. Interesting. Although they haven't had a panel of experts tell us that this is the best stuff, but in the background it's there. Would anyone go for image? Is there, is there an image aspect to this though? Okay, okay, and so that might, you might want to tie yourself to that too. It's also like really pleasantly laid out and, and color and stuff like that. But we don't have a celebrity up here, rec I believe, right? We don't have a recognizable celebrity. Okay, well, that might be another. So there's pretty much an example. So could you then put together like a little two minute thing and say, and, and sort of say, uh, you know, uh, I am uh, I, I'm Amazon. Hi, thank you. And I, I would you know uh, you know I would like to like basically I'm Amazon's agency, and I I propose to make you an ad which is really gonna you know foreground the you know the wide selection of products we have here at Amazon that you could use. Uh, we want to you know tie this to a young, clean, fresh look. Uh, and here's my mock-up, basically. And I'm thinking my target audience is young women with natural hair who, you know, want, want this type of product, right? So it would be that type of pitch. And uh, we will, uh, the important thing here is the reflection that goes along with it and the sharing. Uh, I hope you don't feel intimidated just by, you know, the actual presentation aspect of it. Okay, boy, I'm really kind of running fast. Uh, so. We've got sort of five minutes. Could I put William and Max and Chow together? And Chow has a mag for you guys? I don't see much you don't see much in Sports Illustrated? OK. The other thing is, if there is an advertisement that you already know that you want to sort of pre present to your group uh, and just say, maybe we should work on this one, um, can you maybe you could pull it off your phone or something as well? So Sports Illustrated is not doing it for you. Well, let me give you maybe Coastal Living and uh, Fortune. Why don't you guys check that out? <laughs> OK. Could you two, you two guys and Michaela work together? And Gordon, do you want to work with Gabe and Desiree? And then back row together, Josias, Michael, and Lonnie. So the idea is just, cheers. The idea is just to find an ad that you can then think about and work together. And again, if you found something in the mag already, great. If there's a proposal you have off your phone, that would be cool too. 
So the idea really is just in the next five minutes to find one and share it, and then we'll take it from there next class, okay?